Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending October 13th. First up, this article was sent to me by Phil, Cuca writer. This is an update. If you remember a few TDD reports back, I talked about an enclosed motorcycle that was self-balancing. It was the creation of Daniel Kim. There's some updated information before on the first article I got about this. They were saying they were only going to release this in the UK. Well, evidently, according to the New York Times article, and as usual, all links will be down in the description, this will be sold in the United States. And as a matter of fact, Daniel Kim plans on going around to various college campuses and giving test drives. Now, hopefully, if he does come to the Chicagoland area, to any of the colleges around here, I might get a shot at actually being able to go over. Probably the line will be long to test drive, but I would at least like to have a shot at checking it out and getting some film of other people test driving it. My thinking on this, too, is it is such, like they said in the article, it's such a niche vehicle that I don't really know if you'll get a market enough to be able to mass produce them and get the price down to anything reasonable. But what I was thinking is his, he must have applied for patents for the self-balancing part of it. I was thinking in a conventional motorcycle like all of us drive, if we could get some kind of gyroscopic self-balancing, that way a lot of people that have leg, ankle problems, foot problems as they get older maybe just don't have leg strength, if you could have a self-balancing motorcycle to where you would not necessarily have to put your feet down if you came up to a stop, that could be something great too. So I think he should pursue not just trying to sell it as a vehicle, but using some of his patents for upgrades on future motorcycles might be a cheaper alternative to have a motorcycle with just a couple of gyro stabilizers in it rather than having to buy a trike or add training wheels or a sidecar to be able to keep riding, especially later on if you have some kind of leg problems. So that's just my take on that. And next up, I don't know if you've been on the internet at all in the last year, you have probably heard various authors and promoters about Nibiru or Planet X coming in around Christmas time this year and doing various things from flipping our planet upside down to throwing it out of orbit. Well, it's, you know, middle of October right now and I would say if there's any chance this is going to happen at all which I think there's zero chance we would have been able to see something pretty definite by this time and as a matter of fact I've been hearing about this since Christopher Hitchens book back in uh, 1985 I think he wrote the first book about that and I think at that time he actually called this so-called Death Star or Planet X or whatever you want to call it he called it Anunnaki and it's been given various other names too I think even all the names I've given aren't everything it's been called but in the world of real science, where we're not out to sell books to people and promote stuff just to scare people and take their money, um, if you want to wait till next winter time, about this time, we might be able to see one of the brightest comets we're ever going to see in our lifetime. Now, I ended up catching Hale Bop when it came around the last time, but this comet that's going to be around next Christmas is called Comet Ison, and two Russian scientists, which have a little bit difficult names to pronounce, I don't know if that was the reason they decided to name it Comet Ison after the observatory that they actually used to spot it. It's called the International Scientific Optical Network, so rather than using their two last names, um, I guess, you know, you find it, you get to name it whatever you want to name it. But this comet's actually going to come in closer to the sun than even Mercury, so anything that's on this comet, if it has a lot of ice and carbon dioxide and various things that can gas off, this may end up being pretty brilliant around this time next year. So if you get a chance, check that out. Comet Ison, and this article is from Hudson Valley Almanac Weekly dot com. So, last week I had the Guess a Tool segment by my buddy Mick and he showed us a pair of pliers. Um, most of the people that did guess on it actually got it correctly but I will let him instead of revealing it myself I will let him in his video explain exactly what these pliers are and how they're used and following that I did make a request that if anybody has some tools they would like to demonstrate or a tool gadget kind of tool that they would like to demonstrate my buddy Arizona Wacko decided to take me up on the offer so immediately following my buddy Mick you will see Arizona Wacko giving you another tool to guess. I'm about to give you the answer to my quiz and uh, that was what are these pliers there you have it, a standard set of pliers basically with a little attachment to it so uh, hopefully you figured it out but uh, if you haven't 
I shall demonstrate. You put your wire through like so. And then uh, grab your piece of wire in the end. And uh, down the bottom of the um, handle, I'll actually show you here. Down on the bottom here you have a little lug. And in there is a little recess. And what I'm going to be doing is squeezing the wire and pushing that little lug all the way into that uh, recess and, and enable to lock the pliers. Whoop, well, I've gone off, gone off screen there. I'll just do it again. So it's got that little lug there to go into that recess. So what I want to do is basically squeeze the uh, wire with the pliers tight and then I'll show you how I lock the pliers. So uh, what we do, we get our ends like so. Can you see that? And then, uh, let's see if we can turn around to it. So I squeeze the pliers tight, get the uh, little lug in the recess, like that. And on this barrel here in the middle, there's a little sliding bar. So I'm just going to pull it down, and you hear it click. So that locks the wire into the jaws of the pliers and then it's a matter of holding the pliers in the left hand the uh, little knob on the end here in the right hand and you let the wire you get the, sorry you let the pliers go and it twists so to re uh, position your twister you just grab the pliers again let the end go so you grab the end I'll turn around this way, see if you can see it a little better. Oh, there we go. So grab it like that. Twist your pliers. Grab the pliers, let the end go. And back they go. So there you have it. Now to uh, unlock the pliers, you just squeeze the handles again. You hear it click. And there you go. So uh, I'll get down look close and you can just see how well that twists the uh, edges of the wire so of course the more you twist it the uh, the tighter the uh, bind is um, how we come across it was uh, like I said we we're looking for a uh, pair of pliers that did something similar and uh, we found a fella that made fishing lures and uh, and so on so uh, he had a pair. But anyway, that's what they are. They're a set of wire twisting pliers. Hey everybody. Wacko out here in the garage. Uh, those of you who are fans of Suburban Riders TDD report know he's got a little thing going on about uh, odd tools that not everybody uses or has and uh, what they're used for and all like this. So i to do a little video response for that and see if you can all figure out what this tool is used for. Okay. What we got here, you have a bracket. Uh, you're probably not going to see it well with the, uh, there you can probably see it a little bit better, but you have an adjustment screw for holding it in place. You have a pointer of some kind but what is this tool used for guys okay hope you can all figure it out that's it for this week take care everybody I will catch you next week